It's just, it's just mind blowing that a tornado could do this to this small town. The windows start breaking, dogs flying through the air. I didn't know what to do. And it started to, it started to crush my head at the end. The scope and scale of this destruction is almost beyond belief. What does it take to get a more in-depth look into the week's top local news stories? The Debrief brings you inside for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our reporters every week, right here, right now. The Debrief. Hello, I'm Janice Huff in for David Ushery. Tornadoes hitting the heartland are not unusual in the spring, but this time there were deadly outbreaks back to back just weeks before Christmas. More than a dozen tornadoes on the ground in the upper Midwest, the first ever December twister in Minnesota. Tornado warnings, snow squall warnings, and high fire danger from hurricane force winds all happening together. Those storms just days behind one of the worst cold season severe weather outbreaks we've ever seen. Our crews witnessed the devastation firsthand. I'm Paisy Chang here in Mayfield, Kentucky for the debrief where a string of deadly tornadoes tore through this state and decimated entire towns. Mayfield is one of the hardest hit towns in Kentucky. Take a look at what you're looking at now. These are boards from homes, doors, garage doors. This is an entire tree that was just knocked over. It toppled over this house. But before that happened, probably the tornado also ripped out the roof, took out windows, entire sides of the walls of the house. All around here in this neighborhood, people are trying to clean up. We've got a family over there uh, that's taking out some of their belongings. You could see that uh, the roof of their house was completely blown off. And this is the type of destruction that we have seen all over Mayfield. You just heard wind, like just whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And then, I mean, before you could hear anything, I mean, the house has dozens of windows and you just hear crash, 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 crash. It sounded like somebody picked the house up, dropped it, and then it was quiet. Every time I close my eyes, I wake up and I think I'm buried again. The twister cut a path of destruction that stretched from Arkansas to Illinois. Five tornadoes hit Kentucky in all, including one that had an extraordinarily long path of about 200 miles. Authorities say that the level of damage here is making it difficult for them to, one, find possible survivors or recover people from these homes, and also to assess the amount of damage that was done. You look at just the breadth and depth of destruction, just the path, how long it went, and just individual homes destroyed all along the way, forests, everything. It's really incredible. Somebody described it as a war zone. That's kind of what it looks like right now. I've been involved in responding to a lot of disasters, and you can see in people's faces what they're really looking for. And look around, I say to the press, what they're looking for is just to be able to put their head down on a pillow, be able to close their eyes, take a deep breath, go to sleep and make sure the kids are okay. That's what people are looking for right now. And these rare December tornadoes were shocking in their intensity and their timing. Chief Meteorologist Janice Huff is gonna tackle that angle and talk about growing concerns about climate change. Within the past week, we've had two highly unusual severe weather outbreaks in the month of December. Add to that an unprecedented eight tornado touchdowns on Long Island in the month of November. And you have to wonder whether something's up. Climatologist Tom DiLiberto from NOAA joins us now. Hi there, Tom. Thanks for being with us today. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you because um, everybody wants to know. Of course, everybody asks me all the time, and I'm sure they ask you. And you are so great at storytelling and um, explaining in simplest terms to people who aren't scientists what the science is all about. Everyone, of course, wants to know, what is it? Is it global warming? Is it climate change? Is it La Nina? You give me what you, what you know. It could be a little bit of uh, everything, which is why tornadoes and severe weather are just so difficult when trying to figure out like what's the cause it's it's made up of a lot of different causes and it's it's really hard to kind of separate what they call the signal from the noise kind of there's all this stuff going on whether we can pinpoint whether there is a climate connection to it or how much of a climate connection um was involved is really difficult but frankly we're living in a climate changed world already so right. it's hard to tell what came first the big chicken or an egg sort of problem <laughs> And you're right. 
tornadoes are complicated and these systems are very complicated. It's, it's very different from like saying drought or extreme heat and those kinds of things that go directly with climate change. Um, what's your sense of what has been happening in this month of December, particularly with these uh, severe weather outbreaks? Well, I mean, the one thing, if you looked at just basically not thinking about the individual tornado, which can be really small for a second, and thinking broader about what the U.S. looked like during this time period, if you closed your eyes and you were, someone was talking about the conditions, you would have sworn it was probably in the springtime based upon how warm the temperatures were. And one key, key ingredient for severe weather outbreaks is that you need this warm, humid air. And there was just plenty of it. So we had that big storm that caused all those wind reports, like unbelievable gusty winds across the West and such the United States. They were also setting record high temperatures across the central plains. And then we had the unbelievable tornado outbreak in December across Kentucky and in Tennessee and, and, and Missouri. And again, that was also tied to, we just had really, really warm air out in place while this storm was able to, to move in. That warm air is what gives it a lot of energy. And, you know, as opposed to thinking like how much did climate change uh, cause this, I'd like to think of another way. is like, why do we even think that as a question, right? Why right. are we even thinking about it? And the reason is because we know that warmer air is such a vital ingredient for severe weather. And we know that we're warming the world. So it makes sense in the long term that maybe potentially we could potentially see an impact there between climate change because we are warming um, our atmosphere. Now, you did mention we're talking about the warming and you mentioned record high temperatures in New York City today or in the surrounding area. There were several record high temperatures set today here. So we're in that warm air, uh, wedge of air out ahead of that same front. And so we saw records here, too, in our area in the 60s. Upstate New York, Syracuse, I think, was 67 degrees today. Their record was 55, the previous record. So they shattered theirs, whereas Central Park came within one degree of tying the record today. It was 62 this afternoon. And people, of course, are just wandering around going, what happened? Is this May all of a sudden in December? I know that the data shows that of all the seasons, the winter season seems to be affected the most in terms of temperatures by climate change and the warming. Are, what, do you, what do you see on the horizon, so to speak? Are we going to see more of these types of events now in the winter or before winter even starts, actually? So, I mean, if you're going to take a look at all of the seasons and specifically taking a look at, you know, what could potentially change the most, winter would be one of those prime seasons to look at because usually what tamps down severe weather is the fact that there's not a lot of warm air. There shouldn't be a lot of warm air in the wintertime. And as climate change warms, we, that means we can have more of these times where we have these abnormally mild and warm temperatures extending further into the winter season, which then allows for severe weather to actually occur. Now, we all know just because there's severe weather doesn't mean that it's going to produce a tornado. There's other things involved in that. The winter season is one that we do expect, especially across the eastern United States. And one trend that we have seen now, it's hard to tell whether it's directly tied with climate change, but it is a trend is that we've seen the axis of where the most tornado activity in the United States is shift east a bit um, over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, and that has a lot of ramifications because the topography and the way people mm -hmm. live a little bit in the, in the southeast is very different than the central plains. There's a lot more trees, a lot more mountains. So it means a whole lot of uh, additional issues that come into play. But that is one trend that we are seeing is that it's shifting a little bit to, uh, to the east. Yeah, because I, I know that um, a lot of my friends were saying when they were seeing some of the damage from Kentucky and from um, Missouri and, and Arkansas, they were like, I didn't know that Tennessee was in Tornado Alley. And one of the things that we've noticed, I think in the last couple of years, uh, the fewer number of tornadoes in actual Tornado Alley, the, 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 tra the traditional tornado, tornado Alley, but more tornadoes in, like you said, an area that's spreading towards the east. And the southeast, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, up through Kentucky, Arkansas. Uh, and, and it's, of course, highly unusual, like we've been saying, to see this type of activity in December. Um, with what we're seeing in the trends, extremes, would you say this is just one of the signals of the extremes that we would expect with climate change? So I mean, if you look at climate projections into the future, they do basically kind of hint at this mm -hmm. idea that the environment would be more conducive for these sorts of ex like extreme severe weather. Mm -hmm. Whether you can tie it to tornadoes, as I mentioned, a whole lot more goes into it. But this idea that the environment might become a little bit more 
potentially unstable to allow these things does seem to have a little bit of uh, of credence or at least uh, backed up by, by science in there. Now, it's a little bit more difficult with uh, a lot of other things because one example is that we're in the middle of a La Nina and La Nina also happens to tend to shift storms exactly where um, the tornado outbreak happened. So you have all of these compounding factors and sometimes they fight against each other, but sometimes they're all kind of like helping each other out. And it, it, it leads to all these sorts of like potential uh, horrific events that happened. Um, but it also makes it really difficult to be able to say what exactly mm -hmm. um, is the cause of all these things. You mentioned La Nina, and I was just about to ask you about it and how that plays into it. Of course, uh, we're in the La Nina year and um, in the winter. And of course, we also saw uh, just recently within the last few weeks, that extreme weather in Hawaii, where they had all this horrific flooding, where they had blizzards on the top of uh, Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea. So, you know, people were thinking it's snowing in Hawaii. Yes, it snows in Hawaii on those peaks uh, every winter, but to have a blizzard and 100 mile an hour winds and extreme flooding down in the valleys where it's warmer is not as typical. Um, explain how La Nina is a part of this whole process that's happening to us this winter. Well, I'll just say I'm a snow lover, so I was a little <laughs> bit jealous. I was like, we, Hawaii is getting the snow? I haven't seen that much snow in years. Um, so one thing that happens is it relates to the jet stream. The easiest way of understanding what La Nina or El Nino does is that basically messes up where the jet stream goes. Mm -hmm. And the jet stream serves as a storm highway. So if the road's there, a storm's going to take it. So what happens during La Nina is the jet stream gets really wavy mm -hmm. across the Pacific Ocean. So what ended up happening is we got a big wave down that looked like a giant U uh, shape, and it basically brought all that cold air with the warm, moist air from the tropics, and boom. Um, it was a ex perfect example of what you tend to see occasionally during La Nina um, across the Hawaiian Islands. You can have these really big events, these big storms. But what that does is almost like knocking over the first domino. It goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up. And what that does downstream to where we are is it basically sets up this area across the Tennessee Valley where all those storms were, where you tend to see a storm track set up. What we say by that, it sounds exactly what the name means. It's where storms tend to go. And if you basically set up the track and storms tend to go there, you can tend to see heavier rainfall events, heavier snowfall events. Mm -hmm. And if the conditions are right, you could see severe weather. You could see tornadoes. Um, of course, this one was amped up because we just had record warm temperatures also associated with it on top of it which is why we're always talking a little bit about climate change, because mm -hmm. um, that thing may have pushed it a little bit over the edge. And you mm -hmm. can't rule that out um, as a potential uh, potential reason. It's almost like a steroid uh, for it that makes enhances it even more. So the report came out uh, from NOAA about November 2021 being the fourth warmest globally. Um, here in the Northeast, we weren't as warm. We were a little colder than that. But uh, what I want to you to try to explain to um, people who are watching, listening, what that means when you talk about a global scale. You know, people are more always more interested in what happens in their backyard. But explain why that's significant. Sure. So you're right. It's not just global warming doesn't mean that every place is going to warm every single month. There's still weather. There's still the chaoticness of weather happening in a given year. I mean, there's probably going to be some place that's colder than average or cooler than average. What's mm -hmm. remarkable about not only November, but pretty much every month this year is that we've had a La Nina in place for a lot of this. And La, La Nina um, is a cooling of the waters in the Pacific Ocean, the Central East Pacific Ocean. And that's usually tied to cooler global temperatures. Right. So the fact that we're still having temperatures fall in the top 10, the top five monthly temperatures is remarkable because we should not be seeing this. This will likely go down as one of the warmest, if not the warmest La Nina year on record. Um, and it's been nonstop. I mean, it's not as warm as it was last year, which is unreal because last year didn't even have an El Nino, which does the opposite of La Nina. It boosts global temperatures. Um, but we're still seeing, uh, again, the fourth warmest. And one thing to also note is that the warming is not equal everywhere. We tend to see it amplified in the furthest north areas in the Arctic. Um, mm -hmm. And that has all sorts of repercussions, not only for the people who live there, but for the, for the rest of us. Because what, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. We eventually feel it in a lot of places, whether it's just sea level rise or whether these other feedbacks that give more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's sometimes tough because, yeah, sometimes it gets cold where we are. But if you look on a global map, you might be the one blue spot showing below right. average temperatures while mm -hmm. everything else is shaded in red. Now, you might have some people who might say, 
Well, what's wrong with the warming? Uh, that means our heating bills go down in the winter. We don't have to use the heat as much. Explain why um, it's not necessarily always a great thing. Sure. So, I mean, there's going to be some potential benefits, right? In mm -hmm. this idea of there being, well, there won't be as many cold uh, events where cold might uh, sadly kill people in the wintertime. Of course, on the flip side, in the summertime, you might see that increase. Um, but what we're doing is we've built our society assuming a stable climate. And that relates to everything we're, we're discussing here. Um, so even though it might get warmer in certain times of the year that might be quote unquote better, you're messing up the ecosystem that existed in this, this time period. And you can't basically play pick and choose which month that you like that got better because we're talking about this uh, as an entire whole. It messes up uh, bird migrations, animals. Uh, it messes up uh, sea level rise. And especially for a place like New York City, sure, it may get warmer in the wintertime, but you might you're going to get more coastal flooding events too mm -hmm. um during the same time of year so it's one thing where like nothing is happening in a vacuum here if you look at the total weight of the scale the negatives far outweigh the positives when it comes to uh, a globally warmed area and especially even if taking a look at issues just for the new york city area absolutely it is a true domino effect everything that happens tri trickles down to everything else and messes up everything it's not just one thing in particular how do we prepare for this in the short term, in the long time, in the long term? What do people need to realize? What do people need to do? How do we prepare? Sure. Well, the first thing I would say is that uh, there's never a wrong time to prepare. So uh, whether it's now or five years from now or 10 years from now, the answer will always be to prepare and try to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases to zero as fast as possible. That's always the answer. In some sense, it's like the easiest answer in the world. The answer is always going to be reduce it to zero as fast as possible. The hard <laughs> thing is actually doing it, right? Right. right. Um, and there's you know these ideas of adaptation and mitigation. So adaptation right. is dealing with the issues that we know are going to happen based upon what we've already done mm -hmm. for coastal areas across the United States, especially the East Coast, and especially the New York metropolitan region. Coastal flooding days, high tide flooding days are going to drastically increase over mm -hmm. the next 50 years, even by 2050, which is sadly, crazily enough, not that far away. Not that far away. 30 <laughs> exactly. years from now, uh, mm -hmm. 30 years ago, I don't like to remind myself who's 1990. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, these things are going to happen. And one thing I always say when it comes to like, how do you feel like we should handle climate change or deal with climate change? What, what, what can I do as a person? I always say is just talk about it more. If you're discussing with your community what you want to do within your community, talk about how this is going to affect climate change, because this is the problem that's not going to go away. And it's going to be something that we're going to have to be dealing with um, for, for quite a while. Um, but doesn't mean that we have to have that like hanging over our head as some sort of making us kind of uh, scared for the future. It's, it's the future still unwritten. So we still have plenty of time to, to take action to deal with climate change. Excellent information, Tom DiLiberto. I really appreciate you chatting with us tonight on all things uh, climate change and climatology. Um, we really appreciate everything that you've uh, given us tonight in terms of the information. So thanks for coming on. I hope we get to talk to you again sometime soon. Thanks. I had a lot of fun. Thank you for listening. And we want to thank our production team, Darren Price, Melissa Mack, and Ben Berkowitz. I'm Janice Huff, in for David Ushery. We'll see you next time on The Debrief. <laughs>